Give him a couple minutes. They should have plenty of time. And we got those other two talks done, so we don't need to back go in. Um, he <laughs> <laughs> just went to the wrong room. Oh, yeah. Well, I got in here and Sue Harris was getting all set up for her working group. So we both had to look at her oh, calendar right. and she was in the wrong room. I knew I was in the right room. Right. Because we were here before. Oh, well, and also our minute taker has just arrived. Yes. Yeah. So we always, just in time. So we need to give her time to set up. Yeah. So we're going to get started in a couple of minutes. We'll let our minute taker get set up, and I think we're still missing the presenter. Um, Mark Smith, are you in the room? No. I guess it's this session between us and beer, so. What did you say, beer? <laughs> I just heard beer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we can find find a stand in who will. Okay. I can swap the order. Females are the authors on Mark's draft. Is there another author? Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a few. He's presenting. Yeah. <laughs> Barbara can recognize all our voices already. Or almost. Or the history, exactly. Thursday afternoon, is that the problem? Yes. Well, this is going to be a whole no fun if you didn't show up. It's unlikely. You think anyone is still awake? I would not object to somebody else joining me on the minutes. Okay. Helping out just a little bit. It's hard for me. Yeah. So, Xu Ping, are you in the room? Yes. Excellent. Doing Jabra again. Thank you. If uh, someone else want to join in and help Barbara on the Etherpad for minutes, that would be fun. Thank you, Eric. There will be eternal gratefulness dished out. <laughs> Yes, if anyone have the phone number for Mr. Smith, then give him a little nudge would be nice. Otherwise, I think we will have to swap the order of the presentations. Yeah, I mean, we have, we have some buffer at the end here. Um, we'll be all right. If you want to sing something, Suresh, yes. So, um, so our esteemed AD is now going to come up and, and sing a song from, from Bollywood. You know, he has a, in his early years.
send him an email. Oh, yeah. We just talked to him about it at the end of the last session. What happened? Thank you. Right, really not. Not there. Yes. That's it, right? Run faster. We are waiting for you, Mark. <laughs> 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 Right, sorry about that. Okay, so welcome to the second six-man session. We now got um, the presenter for uh, the first uh, presentation on extension headers. Um, Darren is doing the, the other one. And then uh, the plan was to hold questions until the, the end of the two sessions. We can have clarifying sessions after, after Mark's talk and Darren's, but then we can have a general discussion on the topic uh, topic afterwards. Super Mark, uh, if you catch, you. caught your breath, uh, you know, please. Well, I'm presenting uh, no. again later tonight, so <laughs> I'll just finish that one off. Okay, um, in-flight uh, IPv6 header extension uh, insertion cons considered harmful. <clears throat> uh, RFCs 1883 and 2460 say this about um, processing of extension headers. With one exception, extension headers are not examined or processed by any node along a packet's delivery path until the packet reaches a node identified in the destination address field of the IPv6 header. Um, the exception is the hop by hop options header, uh, which carries information which can be examined and processed by every node along a packet's delivery path. The hop by hop options header must immediately follow the IPv6 header. Its presence indicated by the value zero in the next header field. RFC 8200 uh, updated this um, and uh, made it a bit more explicit. Uh, extension headers are not processed, inserted, or deleted by any node along a packet's delivery path until the packet reaches the destination address. <clears throat> and the hop by hop options uh, text was modified in a similar way. Um, the other uh, difference is it says it's may be examined or processed rather than must be. The changes and motivations, well, with regards to the hop by hop header, um, it was found that high speed routers were. Uh, ignoring the requirement of must process. So that was loosened. Sorry, I guess it's all right. Um, the other one was triggered by a draft um, around the time of 8200. Um, it's an example uh, in this. Uh, it's, it's related to the spring work, but I'm pretty sure there's been a few other uh, internet drafts. Uh, <clears throat> and that's why there was some clarifications about what um, EH processing involved. One thing to remember about RFC 8200 is actually one of the 92 full internet standards and there's billions of implementations and there's probably 100 in this room. So the purpose of this uh, internet draft was really to capture the uh, and record the reasons and motivations for the 1883, 2460 and 8200 text uh, and also to describe an IPv6 architecturally compliant solution. To define um, in-flight in uh, EH insertion, we've got a packet going from the left to the right or from A to C. Uh, it's transiting uh, network B and network B on ingress is inserting an in extension header. And then uh, at egress of B, hopefully the extension header is removed so that the original packet arrives at C. Some observations, uh, the original source and destination address of the packet are not modified during insertion and removal, and they couldn't be. The packets are being modified without uh, attribution, so it's an anonymous modification. The packet size got larger, and an immutable next header field got modified as well. The motivation we uh, th this uh, this particular draft hasn't really said why it wants to do insertion. Um, uh, my speculation is that because there's 128-bit segment routing IDs, the same size as IPv6 addresses, it's going to add quite a lot of overhead. And so perhaps the idea is to try and save overhead somewhere else instead of having smaller SIDs. Um, one quote which has been removed, I think um, 
Darren posted version eight of this, but and 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 this is an example of text we might want to look for rather than being specifically one that's continued. Um, there's some theory in the draft since the SRH inserted within a inter intermediate node must be removed when all segments within the SRH have been visited. It is not possible to leak the SRH to the destination outside the source domain. Um, unfortunately, that's a theoretical statement rather than a practical one. Um, I've experienced all three of these things in my career, implementation bugs, partial device failures, and device misconfiguration. So that sort of um, master assertion in a um, internet draft or an RFC is really an aspiration, it's not an assurance. It, it, um, it, it may not be removed. The other thing to, um, to observe or, or be aware of is that these sorts of boundary devices, and while a firewall is not quite the same, um, it's quite common to have only a single instance of them. Um, I have actually heard of somebody having two NAP devices in a row. Um, surprisingly, it was at their home and they were some information security person from EY or something. But most of the time, in my experience, there's only been a single edge device performing these sorts of function. So that, that's really only, that means there's really only one opportunity to perform this operation. And if the operation isn't performed, then the packet just keeps going um, without the changes that it, it's supposed to have. So we have a single point of failure on the, the boundary. Uh, this is a scenario, and this is sort of where where my um, objection comes from. Um, we have a scenario where a packet's traveling across the internet from a source AS on the left, right through the destination AS on the right. Um, the source AS might be, say, a video content provider. The destination AS on the other end is a residential ISP, and I've spent quite a lot of time at those. As our packet goes across the internet, it traverses a number of ASs, and AS1 has chosen to do an onoms EH insertion. For some reason or other, they failed to remove their inserted EH. Because the destination address of the packet hasn't changed, the packet will just keep going to the destination D, uh, uh, AS, and the brokenness would occur at the destination AS. The question then is me as an operator sitting there looking at these packets that may be taking five or 10,000 of my customers' video content offline, is who inserted the H? There's nothing in the packet that tells me that. Um, and therefore, I will have to manually or, or go and brute force contact every single AS, ask that AS, are you inserting AHs? Ask them, are you removing them? And they'll say, no, my vendor writes perfect code. And I'll say, can you have a look, please? It may even involve you know, disconnecting 100 gig links to try and insert some sort of device to, to you know, capture the packets to determine that the device is really performing as it's supposed to be. The, the problem is that this fault is only really seen as the, after the packets left the network. So most operators, and I've certainly been one of them, if you like, I've never inspected the packets leaving my network to see if they're good or not. You know, once they're gone, once the traffic's there, they're gone. So the consequences and impacts, um, the, the sort of fundamental thing is it's ignoring the source address field semantics. The packet has now got, uh, in effect, two devices that have, have, have constructed the packet, but only one of them is identified by the source address. And this means that in, in this case, the, uh, if the EH triggers some sort of mechanism that relies on the source address of the packet, it's not going to work because it can't, it, the, the EH device, the EH inserting device hasn't been identified. So the, the classic case would be ICMP v6. So if the EH uh, triggers an ICMP mechanism of some sort, it will, the, the, the device that sends the ICMP v6 message can only ever send it back to the source address of the packet. Well, that's not the device that inserted the EH. So, it, it, it's not going to make it to a device that can, can solve the issue. A specific case is ICMP v6 PMTUD. The packet size has got bigger because the, of the inserted EH. Um, if that triggers a, a packet too big message, it can't and won't be sent to the EH inserting device because that's not identified. It'll also uh, potentially break IPsec um, or IPsec. If, it will, if it's not removed, when it arrives, it'll look like unauthorized modification of the 
the, the um, packet. Uh, another possibility, in my diagram, I only had one transit network inserting EHs, but imagine if one of those other ones was as well. If the first AS uh, didn't remove the EH and it kept floating along to a later transit network, and that later transit network was also using EH insertion, then the EH might get inside that network and impact operation uh, some other way. Incorrect destination host processing. So one of the issues is that this, this EH that was inserted was not intended to be received by the device with the destination address. And how an unknown, uh, unknown EH is handled is indicated by the top two bits in the type of the EH. This could result in a packet that gets discarded, even though it would actually be possible to skip over the unknown option and process the remainder of the packet. The opposite could occur as well. So a packet could get, I've actually lost which order I did it, but anyway, the packet could get um, uh, processed when it should really be discarded based on the context of the video, so you know the application that, that's in the, in the payload or packet. Uh, implementation complexity, if you think about it, the edge device, the onegris, has to scan the EH chain, assuming it's possibly not the first one, to determine whether there's an EH there to remove or not. This is com more complex than using a simple destination address match. And the destination address says to a device or says to a router, should this be forwarded further using simple forwarding or should more deeper processing of the packet occur? Finally, the, um, I think it's even as fundamental as Postel's law or robustness principle, which says be conservative in what you send, be liberal in what you accept. Inserted EHs are not expected by RFC 8200 compliant receivers as RFC 8200 prohibits them. So purposely sending them is not being conservative. I think the solution's encapsulation. It's the classic way to add new information to an existing PDU. Obviously, we should all understand and remember the TCP and CAPS application, IP and CAPS, TCP, link layer and CAPS, IP. The, uh, to me, the solution is to encapsulate in an IPv6 tunnel. And RFC 2473, the generic packet tunneling over IPv6 spec, actually shows an example of adding new EHs to an existing packet after the new outer IPv6 header. And therefore, RFC 2473 provides EH addition attribution via the outer IPv6 source address. As an example of the benefit, uh, that means that PMTUD works because the, um, the, the tunnel endpoint that increased the packet size is identified by the source address in the outer um, header. There's a really good internet draft that's been in development for quite a while that that expands much more on um, tunnels in the internet architecture. I think from memory it's 20 or 30 pages, so it's quite a big read, but very comprehensive. 50, okay. It's very good. Uh, one of the issues which, which seems to be a, a possible motivation is to, to try and reduce tunneling overhead. One of the struggles I uh, uh, remember dealing with, because I've done quite a lot of um, work in the past with IPsec tunnels, is this idea that there's an IP packet inside of another IP packet. And it's sometimes a bit of a struggle to sort of forget that the payload of the outer packet is an is a, is a IPv6 packet in itself. So in that co context, if we forget about, or we, we just look at the model, in a, in a common IPv6 packet, there's a link layer header on the front, Ethernet, PUP, etc. In a, an IPv6 and IPv6 tunnel, it's the same thing, it just happens to be another IPv6 header, and it's coincidence that the, the fields and the semantics have the same meaning. So if we consider and remember that an IP tunnel is a link layer link, then we can use link layer compression to compress the inner packet. An example uh, would be robust header compression. So you would apply this on the inner packets IPv6 header and possibly other, possibly other headers on the inner packet to compress the effective size of the total. Uh, something else that I worked on a few years back, just as an idea, sort of triggered by this, was what I've called skinny IPv6 and IPv6 tunneling. 
So this actually leverages the fact that the inner packet and the outer packet have the same header and same header semantics. And so what it does is for nearly all of the fields, it basically makes the outer header carry many of the inner fields values and then disposes of nearly all of the inner packet header effectively and then reconstructs it at the other end. Another thing it does is uses slash 64s to identify tunnel endpoints rather than slash 128s. And the uh, unused IID parts of the outer IPv6 header uh, address fields copy and carry the inner packets IID fields. One of the emergent advantages of this is that the actual uh, the the packet the tunnel packets will actually be spread via ECMP because they become inputs into the ECMP load sharing. So that was just an idea, another way of possibly reducing the um, tunneling overhead. All right, thoughts and questions. Oh, hang on, we're doing that later. Well, we can do, if there's any clarifying questions, we can do them now. now. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a clarifying question. Um, I, first part of it, did you read draft foyer number seven? That was the one that was published in September? I did. Okay. And, yeah, sorry. Okay. And then how how are the slides that you just prevent, presented about in-flight extension header slide, the very first one, and your single point of failure slide related in any way to what that draft describes? So what that draft uh, does is it's actually inserting into the tunnel packets. Right. So the packets that are already encapsulated for their journey within the SR domain. Yeah. So the stuff that you were discussing about how a packet that you're sending over the internet might have extension headers inserted between yeah. domains, I mean, that's not relevant, is it? Look, look to some extent, as I said in this, um, uh, this presentation, this is to capture the, the broader issue. I so if, if could could you elaborate on what parts of your presentation were relevant to the draft versus which were in general? P perhaps, you know, Darren, if you present okay. you we'll know, yours and, and then, you know, perhaps we should allow for a few minutes of, you know, you two debating it and we can. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. We can, right. we can wash and eat popcorn. Uh, super. Thank you. Thank you. Bring this up a little bit. There we go. Okay. Now I don't have to slouch. <clears throat> okay. So this um, presentation is, of course, about um, segment routing header insertion within an SR domain. Okay. Um, there's been several versions of this draft. I'll just quickly mention the the one that we're well, We'll be talking about a couple today. I, I just updated the draft uh, yesterday and sent out the mail today. Um, so, you know, we'll of course talk about revision seven, which is a very important revision. Um, but we've made some changes in the most recent one, and we'll 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 go over those too. But I, I think it still leaves all of this discussion entirely relevant. So, um, we we can discuss all the versions of the draft. In revision seven. Um, we made the draft uh, standards tracked. We added a lot of normative text to describe how segment routing header insertion in particular is done within an SR domain. We described the insertion process. We described the removal process. We described ICMP v6 processing, path MTU discovery, um, and uh, went into, I think, a, a lot of good detail on how implementations can do segment routing header insertion within an SR domain. Uh, and do it do it safely within that domain in order to uh, provide you know, different types of services within the domain. In revision eight, we've gone a bit different way. And in revision seven and prior to revision seven, there was a lot of discussion like the first part of, of Mark's slide where it was kind of thou shalt not do segment routing header insertion because 25 years ago, we wrote some text that said extension headers aren't inserted, modified or deleted, except that a source or destination. And while that was very applicable to the to the larger internet, we are looking at segment routing header insertion within an SR domain, and that's a much more limited scope. So what we've done in revision eight is we've we've described now um, 
how deployments and implementations are doing segment routing header insertion, uh, why they're doing it, and documenting the fact that it is done um, so that this community can understand that this is something that's real, it's happening within uh, limited domains, within SR domains, uh, and get some of the motivation for why that's happening, okay? But we can still talk about both revisions uh, today. I think it'll be more fun that way. <clears throat> okay, who's deploying this? We saw some of this this morning, so I'll skip over it quickly. SoftBank, China Telecom, Iliad, China Unicom, CERNet, MTN Uganda are all deploying SRv6. Um, and uh, uh, with SR insertion within their domains. Who's supporting SRH insertion and removal in their implementations? Uh, you guys have seen this in previous presentations in Six Man. I'll highlight uh, Custom ASICs from Cisco Huawei. Merchant Silicon, Broadcom, Marvell, uh, Intel uh, are supporting the insertion and removal capability um, and some open source uh, content. So one thing that's important for us to remember is that SR domains encapsulate the traffic that's traversing them. We had a lot of discussion over the last couple of years that I've been involved in this working group on that with regards to the SR header draft that's now nearly RFC'd. Um, and we do encapsulate the packets that are traversing the domain uh, always. So packets that are traversing it or packets destined to nodes within the domain or packets from the, within the, in the domain, exiting the domain are always encapsulated. So in other words, all the packet headers within the domain have a source and destination address that are for nodes within the SR domain. So the SR domain is protected in that um, devices outside the SR domain don't get access to those SIDs within the SR domain. And we've said this in the SR header draft, soon to be RFC, um, about how that, uh, how that domain is protected. And I'll go through how the implementations uh, and deployments actually do that protection. So let's remember that domain. Um, encapsulates everything. So packets going from node one to node two, when they traverse the domain, they get encapsulated, outer IP header. Um, packets going from one to five would also be encapsulated for the journey within the domain uh, between three and five. Um, so we'll reiterate that. Sorry, and uh, yeah. just a clarifying question, could you just, the two of you are using like different styles here. So could you just explain the what the, the dots and the numbers and stuff. Oh, okay. So in this diagram, this this is out of um, this is out of the draft. So uh, who's read the draft in any of the versions? All right, lots of people. Oh, awesome. Okay. So um, and this is similar to the SR uh, header draft as well. It uses the same thing. So node one is connected to node three, three to five, five to six, six to four, and four to two. Okay. Uh, nodes three, five, seven, eight, six, and four are all within the SR domain. Node three and fours are essentially PEs of the SR domain, ingress, egress, PEs for packets heading from left to right. Sound good? Seven and eight are other nodes within the SR domain. Okay. All right, they're also, seven is attached to five, seven is attached to eight, eight is to six, okay? Okay, I'm giving it as an example that there's a um, some network that has some edge nodes and nodes outside of it connect to those edge nodes and traffic that traverses the SR domain gets encapsulated. And the like three does the encapsulation, assuming it's going. That's right. That yeah. So let me let me clarify that as well. For a packet from node one to node two, node three receives that packet. Node three encapsulates in an IPv6 header between node three and four. Okay. Um, the source of the packet, the outer IP header, is node three. The destination of that outer IP header is a SID at node four, and that packet traverses node five, six, seven, eight, et cetera. Well, depending on its path, hopefully not all of them. So what operators have done, for example, and, and this isn't specific to any one of the operators, uh, this is in general, they, they make a choice as to, um, as to how they define SIDs within their domains. So for example, an operator with a GUA block of slash 28, PPP, PP something, slash 28, uh, 
would use their block to sub allocate a block of SIDS. So PPP colon B, where B is the B is the block of SIDS with a let's say a slash 40. Okay. And within that block of SIDS, so that, that slash 40 identifies all the SIDS within that SR domain. Within that block of 40, there's let's say a slash 64. Darren, Andrew here from Liquid. I just want to ask a clarifying question because you refer here multiple times to a SR domain, right? Can you clarify exactly what you mean by an yeah, please, SR please domain? Please read the drafts. Thanks. Okay. Um, so again, we allocate a slash 64 SID locator to each of the nodes in the domain where that prefix is, for example, P b4 for example at node 4 so it node 4 receives a for example a slash 64 from which it can allocate segment ids for use at that node so anyone familiar with our sr header document um, should remember that those sids are then used for different things who's familiar with srv6 network programming who's read that looked at it okay good all right so the majority of the room then is also familiar with the fact that different SIDs are allocated at those, <clears throat> excuse me, allocated at those nodes. <clears throat> Oops, okay, here we go. And we do have experience in, in automating this process of, of course, um, block allocations to nodes. Okay, so the, uh, I guess the user error in that area is, is pretty low. <laughs> The next part is in and how we protect the SR domain. And if you'll remember, the SR header and the SR header draft um, defines how we filter uh, external traffic entering the domain. And at the ingress edge, we apply an ingress ACL that drops any packets destined to that SID block within the SR domain. And then on internal nodes, we also filter traffic um, destined to the local SID block from any source address that is not within the SR domain. So we protect who is able to access those SIDs and use those SIDs. And again, we have experience automating that process as well. So the chances of user configuration error are very low. So within this SR domain, what these operators provide is, is a VPN service that, um, well, that I, I described previously essentially, so there's an ingress PE at node three and egress PE at node four, and the ingress PE performs that IPv6 encapsulation. <clears throat> With a SID that will decapsulate that outer IPv6 header when the packet reaches node four. Now that SID might be an n.dx or n.dt SID. For those who don't know, those simply say forward the inner packet on an adjacency or forward the inner packet based on a lookup in a particular uh, v4 or v6 table. Within this SR domain, providing a, a layer 3 VPN service, there's a feature called TILFA. TILFA provides a uh, less than 50 millisecond link and node protection for traffic traversing that domain. And remember that traffic is all source and destined to nodes in the domain. <clears throat> For that TL TILFA uh, traffic, we are going to be forming SR header insertion. Yeah, go ahead. You have a question? Yes. Uh, so uh, you give uh, name, please. Uh, Greg Mursky, <laughs> ZT. Uh, you give very specific uh, time. So is it switch over for one tunnel or switch over for some number of tunnels? Okay. So that's more of a feature thing, I guess. So um, in the products that I'm aware of, uh, for any traffic destined via a node or, or a link that fails, the repair path is pre-computed for that traffic. And that point of local repair inserts an SR header to get around that link or node failure to the destination. So where I say a 50 millisecond or sub 50 millisecond packet loss, that's the, that's the, the implementation, at, implementation at that point of local repair that's pre-computed um, this repair path that inserts the SR header that then sends everything that's destined or that's via the link or node that's failed um, 
over that pre-computed uh, path. Okay, okay? but uh, you can have um, off this uh, edge of the segment. So your next segment can be several IP hops away. Yeah, and, so and how do you know that that tunnel has failed, and you need to route a, not a, a route? Okay, your so link. At, at this point in the middle of the of the SR domain, I don't care if this traffic is tunneled. I don't care that it is tunnel traffic. All I care about is that this traffic is destined to a node that I have protection for. I protect traffic destined mm -hmm. to any node in the network with a pre-computed pre path that is going to get me around any link or node failure for which I am the point of local repair. If you want, you can read the TILFA draft, and that one's got a lot of detail on, on how this actually works. But for the purpose of this presentation, um, let's take it for fact that no. these, these <laughs> nodes insert it. an SR header. Uh, no, Because uh, otherwise, I'm, I'll, I'll get you to sit down, I'll finish this one, and then we'll come back to, to what it is that you're asking because I, I, I'll ask you, is it related in any way to SR insertion within an SR domain? Uh, well, or are you interested in how TILFA works? No, no, uh, you, you give specific number and uh, you don't okay. explain how you arrive to this number. Okay, it's an implementation specific thing as a feature of the products that, uh, that are listed and used in that domain. Okay. So that's a specific number, thanks. Okay, so let's go over where does SR header insertion occur? It occurs at any node within the SR domain, okay? Um, and that's any node that's at point of local repair. So in this case where we're doing TILFA, a node that is a point of local repair running, uh, supporting TILFA is going to insert that SR header, okay? That assertion occurs on the outer IPv6 header which is the one that, that essentially tunnel header between the node three and node four within the domain. The SR header removal occurs at the destination address in the, in the outer header. So that SR header gets inserted and it's removed at a node that the inserting node decided on when it inserted the SR header. So that destination node in the packet receives it uh, in the terms of uh, network programming. He, he pops, he says a penultimate segment pop um, and removes the SR header that was previously inserted and the packet continues on its journey to the destination node within the domain. So, so Darren, could I ask a yep. clarifying question? So are you saying that node three would not insert a a S or will that packet from the, you know, node number three would not have an SRH header? Well, in the in the layer three VPN example, yeah, um, there's no need for the SRH header because it is just encapsulating with an end dot DX or DT SID. If there were traffic engineering also applied, well, then yes, you could have an SR header. But since you're be... saying SID, would it not? How, how would you? If you have a packet with a SID, do you have to have an SRH header as well, right? Do you? No, well, I'm asking. No, you don't. No, the the answer is you don't because. If I simply encapsulate an outer IP where the destination address of that IP, uh, that outer IP is an SRV6 SID, and that SRV6 SID's behavior is to decapsulate the packet, then we'll, we'll decaps. And I think that is actually right, okay. described in the SR header draft as well. Yeah. Bernie Bell, so clarifying hey, question. Isn't it, I mean, you're saying just the EH is removed, but isn't it the whole outer header that's removed because that's the destination node. So it's not really removal, it's just sort of taking the... Well, in, in, it, it depends. So if that, um, if the node that receives this packet with the inserted SR header is node four, and the SID is the decapsulate SID, then of course that entire IP header is removed. Okay. If the node that receives that packet is another node prior to node four in the example, then the removal would happen at, an, at a, a node before node four. Okay? It's up to the node that inserted the header to also specify what the SID is that's going to remove the header. Okay, okay and that was described in revision seven of the draft uh, in more detail. Uh, I got a question. Yes, Chupin, go ahead. It's from uh, Sri Hari, and uh, the question is, when SRH is inserted at a PLR, 
Will the SA be changed to PLR node? No, it's not. If it is not changed, and if there is a problem problem along the backup path that requires IC, ICMP v6 packet generation, where does ICMP v6 packet reach? In the example, it would be sent to node 3, and node 3 would process the ICMP error. Uh, since SA is not changed, will it reach the PLR, our original source, uh, source node? It'll reach the original source node, node 3. Okay. Thanks. Um, Darren, I want to ask uh, a Andrew. bit of a clarification. Yeah, it's Andrew here. A <laughs> um, bit of a clarification, and if it is in some RFC, please tell me where sure. so that I can go and read it. Um, so you say that on the on the backup and on the protection it inserts a header. Now, in an SR domain that potentially spans 10,000 kilometers, 15 countries, thousands of links, I want to clarify what happens if I get a break here, and then I get a break there, and then I get a break there, and I get a break there, and I'm now running six breaks deep. Okay. Am I ending up with six header insertions and very, very large stacks as a result or not? I'm, no. I'm, I don't so the, quite understand that. Yeah, so I, I'll suggest that you read the the TILFA draft and the uh, way that that post-convergence path is computed. I can send you to the uh, link to that later, Andrew. Thanks. <clears throat> Mark, yeah, Mark Smith? Mm -hmm. Hey, can you, uh, we haven't organized the CMO suits yet. Hey, no, shh. <laughs> <laughs> can you go back to the, the diagram? The, um, the, okay. The, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, that good enough? Well, yeah, that's enough. No. So, so where I would, the approach I would take is that I would make three and five tunnel endpoints and then five and six tunnel endpoints and then six and four tunnel endpoints. And those are then the opportunities where you can add or insert or remove your SRH. Okay. And then that gives you the attribution, the source address update and, and so on. So. Okay. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, let's. Let's hold on to that, and let's not forget that you said that, okay? Okay. Yeah, Charlie from Huawei. And I think the uh, SIH uh, can be inserted uh, within the SRV6 domain, and it will be removed uh, within the SRV6 domain. So I that's think right. it's secure. It's, it's, yeah, secure. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, that's what I was trying to point out during yes. Mark's presentation and is that we, it doesn't escape. It's my understanding. The maximum SRH number would be two, but we can make it numbers, but we don't need to do that yet. Yeah. So yeah, the uh, there's some there's some math and some research that's in also in the TILFA draft saying what uh, what the uh, kind of typical or maximum uh, sizes would be for those inserted SIDs. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is a good idea. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the draft does talk about MTU planning seven and eight. Both talk about it. Um, uh, MTUs at the ingress nodes are, of course, uh, less than MTU uh, in the uh, in the domain itself. Um, this is pretty standard operational procedure. Um, Joel, do you want to wait one minute? I can wait one minute okay. when you finish your last slide. All right. So we've seen from the beginning it's deployed, it's functional, there's vendors doing it. The purpose of revision eight is to state that fact and let the community understand what's going on and what's happening and understand that this is a fact and it's, it, it is what's being done within SR domains. Um, we do expect this to happen a lot more over the next few months and of course over the coming years. So this, this situation of SR header insertion within an SR domain um, isn't going to stop regardless of the outcome of this discussion. Go ahead, Joel. Okay, I mean, let me just comment on your last point. Saying we're going to violate the RFC no matter what you do is a bad reason to ask us to change the RFC. Please don't. <laughs> now, let's back up. The thing I didn't hear in this whole thing was any explanation for why, other than saving a few bytes, you need to do insertion instead of encapsulation for this TILFA problem. We know how to, I'm not arguing that one shouldn't do TILFA. I have read the TILFA drafts. They you, do work you, you really do have nicely. Options. You do have options to do encapsulation and implantation. I'm so saying that there's also the capability of doing the header insertion within the SR domain where that is a limited domain where you can ensure that, that this insertion is going to be 
uh, Darren, is, is not going to escape the domain. That and that is the, the answer, Joel. I asked. But that is the answer. The answer okay. is you wanted to. That's not a good answer. So, so I think we now have moved away from clarifying questions to mm. the uh, <laughs> actual debate. Um, and I, I've got to say that both Mark and I were very upset that you did not tell us that there was going to be a debate, because if you did, we would have arranged some sumo suits, and we could have like right. it would have been spectacular. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to make sure. Yeah, we're, well, well, we'll plan that for the next. Okay, good. Kevin. The next debate. I don't. I don't think this is going to be done tonight. <laughs> so, um, Suresh Krishnan as AD. Uh, Joel, to respond to one point, right? Like from version seven to version eight, the draft has been changed to informational. So they're not seeking to change the standard. Okay. No, I'm just saying, right? So now it's like really like a documentation of some like implementation deployment rather than trying to change it. So for me, that changes something in my brain. Okay. Um, it, it's a different thing. So um, I do understand your point, but that's not what. Darren is proposing. Today. Okay, so it's, since we're in the uh, debate portion of the event today, um, so uh, I'm going to take uh, the mic. We're asked, yeah, hold on to the mic. Um, Mark is also coming up, and people can come to the line and ask questions. So we're we're going to shake hands. Answer as appropriate. Okay, look at that. How, how well do you sing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and to your question before, it's like it is a debate. It's not wrestling. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I think. Well, this is, I don't know. Okay, since, since I was at the first person to get up to the mic, um, I, I'm going to kick off the questions. So just a second. Um, I got two. So first one is... Okay, uh, hold on, Shupeng. I'm going to... Well, I'm going to... No, actually, let's do the... We know you can talk to each other, but let, I, we would like to hear from the people okay. at the mic. Oh, she's got a jabber coming. No, I understand. That's fine. Yeah, go ahead with the Jabber comment, right? Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's where we're going. Yeah. Okay. So the first one is still from uh, Thresh Harry, and there's a follow-up question to SA. It's not updated at PLR, and if there is a issue with MTU, what is expected by Node three when it tries to send the packet again? Yeah, revision seven of the draft describes that. Thanks. Uh, another one from Zheng Qiangli. It's a clarification question. I just want to make sure that the operators uh, uh, you mentioned deployed SRH insertion, not purely SRH. If so, could you please add the SRH insertion uh, scenarios in the deployment draft? Um, could, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to say yes. I'll listen to recording. I'm I'm not sure what was what was asked, but I'll listen to it and I'll I'll try to answer that. Oh, Eric Cohen, I'm I'm not a router implementer, and okay. I did not follow the SRH development. So this is just a hypothetical question. The uh, if the SRH um, header was uh, say large enough and had padding at the end, is it computationally the same or more expensive to uh, say rewrite the SRH to sort of Insert your stuff at the top rather than insert. I see. So header. when if yeah, were, so that's a scratch space. Yeah, so that's really going to depend on a hardware implementation as to whether that you know you can how how well they're able to kind of do the split versus the just right into. Uh, it's I would say that's very implementation specific because given given that you are having to take MTU sizing considerations into into effect in this network as in the SR domain anyway, you mm -hmm. could sort of like maximally pad it. <laughs> Uh, at, at at insertion and just allow endless scribbling over it all the way until you got to the end. But I, I, I'm not, like I said, I'm not a router implementer. Yeah, so I mean, I the really TLVs know. can be changeable based the on the TLVs text. can change it in the header. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I, we, we didn't go that way. Um, I, I don't think we would, but I, I understand the point. Hey, Eric Nordmark, I actually came up to ask a clarifying question, but I don't think. Uh, oh, so you can. I can't. Okay. Well, um, but in terms of protection, what you described, and I checked the CRA draft as well, it talks about protecting people from in injecting things with this prefix, right? Yeah. I assume that people configure it so that prefix doesn't leak as a DA as well out any part of the domain, but that's not written up in the draft. Yeah, actually, I think Brian had a similar comment. So, um, so I guess it's basically how, how how do you make sure at that egress edge that I'm not sending a packet to something that's not an egress edge? Is that 
I yeah, that's, that's not saying. in the slash 40 prefix, yeah. right? But yeah. it doesn't go yeah, outside. I think, yeah, I think Brian asked that same question on the list, and I think, okay. we, can, I think we can address that. Yeah. I'd use a ULA okay. prefix for that. <laughs> well, seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that one way. There's, yeah, there's, there's stops. Exactly, yeah. it, it does. Um, another way is, you know, of course, you've got ingress ACL, throw on an egress ACL. Or, it's another option. Yeah. Uh, Robin from Huawei. Uh, I think this is uh, interesting the debate. Uh, from my point of view, this is uh, just uh, show the conflict uh, confliction of the issue of the uh, network boundary. Yeah, because uh, you, right. I think I mentioned some mail. I think that's uh, some we thinking about this the IPv6 uh, based on the internet, but uh, some is based on the limited domain. So I think this is because this is a different requirement. We have the different uh, concern. Yeah, so from our point of view, I think the SIH insertion work, I think this is in the, in the current deployment, deployment, it always use, the, from my point of view, the mobile transport or the IP core transport like this one. So I think this concern is a, a risk from the internet. I think it can be controlled. This is the first one. So some uh, of it. Oh, go on. Yeah, a second one, I think, in fact, we also compare in the, the per possible, this is the choice. I think maybe we also use some of the tunnel method like this one. I think this will introduce the more complexity and the overhead. So I also can reduce this, the design, this, the simplicity. That is also the concern on this one. So I, I think some of this comes down to <clears throat> claiming to follow IPv6, RFC 8200, and then not actually following it. And it might sound like an academic argument, but <clears throat> you're either following it or not. And if, if, if SI come up with IPv10, that's a copy of the IPv6 spec, but allows this, and then says we use IPv10. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, RFCs are always open to being updated. I think the I think what's highlighted in this discussion, um, and Brian Carpenter has a has a draft on this that is not finding a home in six man, um, but I'm has a draft on this on unlimited domains. I'm one of the IC reviewers of that one. There you go. Um, so he's describing a, a case where you know not not. There, there, there do exist, and he's recognizing the fact there do exist domains where things other than what are, you know, what are stated uh, for protocols across the internet um, are applicable. And I think this is one of those cases with the SR header insertion within an SR domain. So I, I'm, I'm not that surprised that you put like uh, MPLS up there. And one of the things that I've Particularly, and you might have seen me quote the RFC 8200 earlier today. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, in MPLS, although people, Go ahead. in MPLS, although people probably have never done this, imagine you've got two LSRs with an Ethernet link between them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Obviously, everybody would do point to point Ethernet these days. But if you inserted an Ethernet switch or bridge in between, that's sort of the equivalent of what an IPv6 router is. So in, in IPv6, IPv6 routers forward packets for non-local destinations. Mm -hmm. A host is anything else. And so in the MPLS model, LSR, like comparatively, LSRs would be IPv6 hosts. And an Ethernet switch would be the equivalent of IPv6 router. <clears throat> and so that's where, when I look at the, the, the diagram up there mm -hmm. and see those intermediary hops, to me, they're actually IPv6 hosts, or should be. And tunnel endpoints okay, are actually yeah, yeah, that, uh, yeah. hosts. <clears throat> and therefore, yeah, then once you go from one link to another in MPLS. That's very, that's a, that's a, that's a heck of a convoluted. So basically you're saying build tunnels between every node. Yep. OK, I, I, I would not want to deploy that. Jalinko, <laughs> um, I'm fascinated in this discussion. And I remember when we had the same discussion when 8200 was written, I can remember, was it you, Shirish? Someone said, we can say we should not modify headers, but if you find a use case and a way to do it safely, we can review the decision, mm. right? So I'm a bit confused with your presentation and your draft, Mark, because I think it's actually trying to say not what is exactly in the title, because 
it the title says insertion is harmful but what i see on the slide you're saying that uh, removing is harmful because if if you look at your slide and let's say i have a server on the left and the source node insert uh, oh, generates you, a packet with extension Jen's header. got a use case she hasn't told us <laughs> well hasn't told me she yeah, wants to I, I have other removed. use case. I just didn't want to put more oil in that fire and submit my draft. Uh, understand. But... We're, we're, and, and Ollie so, has... Jen and I are going so, for beer So basically, all, most of your concerns are still applicable if the source node has an extension header. If the packet was generated with that extension header and it was not removed on the fly, right? And the edge of the domain. So I qualify this because Ollie brought up some examples from IPsec. There's bump in the stack and the bump in the wire. Uh, bump in the stack, I wouldn't consider to be in-flight insertion because the source address in the packet sure. is the source that's mm -hmm. is the device that's mm -hmm. inserting. Yeah. It may not be mm -hmm. at the IP layer; it's happening lower. Yeah. But in terms of protocols like ICMP, PM2D, sure. yep. yep. that's all. I think we all working. Agree. Yeah, but it, the problem will be just say we have a server in data center which generates a packet with uh, SR or any other extension headers and i expect them to be removed at the age or never leak all your problems on your slides are actually the same right because Probably, it's not about the, so basically that, all those problems caused are not by the fact that someone in the me on the fly inserts them it doesn't matter where is this extension well, header coming exactly. from it might be generated originally with the original uh, packet it, it, by the sender it's just the problem is they're not removing it right that if you do read the draft mark, that is what you put in section problems with extension header removal. Like that's that's basically the whole draft talks about. Hey, extension header removal can have these problems. Sure. And, and okay, that, that, <laughs> but that's those, not a that's the, the, the proposals I've seen have always been in-flight insertion and in-flight removal. So mm -hmm. yeah. So I basically, I just I haven't I, seen this sort of, what, what okay. case. Jen's talking about. Yeah, so basically, I think the document is a bit confusing, yeah, because basically the statements you're making, it's not what I think you're trying to say. Well, it's all about failing failing to do something and the consequences of it. No, I, I can generate packet with extension headers. Uh, that's fine, right? Uh, so you, you are, you're fine with this, right? You just don't, you just don't, you just think what is harmful is intermediate node to deal with it. Yeah, I'd like to see your case before I absolutely uh, understand that. But go ahead, Ben. Okay, uh, Robin again. So I uh, asked the IELTS uh, two comments. The first one, I think uh, we should respect the RFC, uh, but I think this uh, needs to be driven by the requirement. Yeah, I think this is the I think the RFC eight two zero zero proposed many times in the mailing list, but. Uh, I think the SRV6 is helpful to IPv6. I think this is also, and also proposed this is the requirement of the fast reroute, and this is the binding seat. This is also is the, I think the insertion is a simple way to solve this requirement, the first one. Can I the, call you the, when I lose 50,000 users off my network? Well, again, this is within an SR domain. It's not. It's it's not within. The, it, the, it, but, but that's yeah, sort of I, the thing. Second one, I want to say, I emphasize this. I think this we believe in the running code. I think we already say that the Intech, the Europe, this advanced network tester center already tests the fast SRV6 the TRFA. Mm -hmm. That's between the different vendors. So I think this already, I think this is So the used. thing to keep in mind, and I put it in my slides, this is a more broader IPv6 six-man issue, yeah, while the, this the, is being an example. Yeah. So, so, so the, yeah, the, the problem is, is that uh, with your slides and with your draft, is that you are not considering the proposal that's made. The proposal that is made is SR header insertion within an SR domain, and you say extension header insertion on the internet is bad. And you know what, I, 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 I don't want my phone, wherever it is, when I'm talking to whatever, to have extension headers inserted within the packets that it is generating. Uh, yeah. It might cause me problems, but if a transit domain happens to encapsulate my pack and do whatever the heck it wants with my packet, I, as an endpoint, am not infected by it. So your, your examples in your draft, your examples in your slides um, had no unfortunately no relevance to the question 
that's well, being asked. Well, so I think this comes down to in your SR domain, are you talking IPv6 or not? Yes. So let's. I I think let's let's go to the final phase. I have some conclusions, and I think Sharesh does <laughs> as well. I want to thank you both. Thank I you. This has been quite good. Um, we didn't come to blows. So <laughs> no, We're did. going for beers. So I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. There's a lot of beer. Thank you very much. <laughs> Woo I hope you're all entertained. So, sure. Okay. Let me go first. Yeah. Then, go so, so uh, as someone said earlier, when we were talking about this, when we were doing what PKMRC 8200, what was said was, you know, this is the default case. You can't do insertion or modification, whatever was on that slide and yeah. in the draft. But if someone can write a document which describes um, how you would do it and, and deal with the issues, then that could be considered. And so the first thing I note is that we have discussed this in email quite a lot. So I think it's quite good that Mark has started the process of writing a document that actually writes down the issues. I, you know, I, I don't, this is, a, you know, the first version of this draft and I think it's good. it needs a lot of work, but I think it's good that we're getting these issues written down because you, because it gives, you know, it lays them out and so, so if there's a proposal like we've just heard about for SR, SRH insertion, they can say how they address the issues and then we can consider it rationally as opposed to just endless email. So I think this is quite good. Um, I don't think we're quite done to, to consider either of these, but I, you know, I think this is a constructive way of dealing with it better than just the, you know, gigabytes of um, email that we did before. So, yeah, well, that's good. The, I, that's why we write documents here uh, is to write these issues down and get agreement on them. And, and I think both of these things could exist at the same time because they can address each other. Um, and, you know, and the things, some of the things I heard about, you know, it's just off the top of my head, it seems like doing insertion in a tunnel packet seems less problematic than just doing the general case of insertion, which is what RFC 8200 is really talking about. So I think there's some ground here to, to work in um, that is reasonable. So let me, Go to Suresh. Yeah, uh, Suresh Krishnan. So, uh, Bob, you covered most of the things I wanted to say. So, like, originally when I threw down this gauntlet kind of thing, right, saying, like, okay, explain how this works on the internet, I I don't think that bar has been met. So, like, I, I agree with a lot of the problems that, like, Mark brought up in his presentation. And I contend they're not relevant in the stuff that Darren talked about, right? And And so if somebody comes to me and says, like, hey, this is Darren's draft, let's go change 8200, I'm going to say, hell no, right? But but I don't think that's the ask, and the ask has changed yep. in the draft, okay, from version seven to version eight. So that's kind of like you know we are not past the emotional stage, like to look at that. So I think the ask is completely different than before, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm way more comfortable with like version eight, talking about experiences and deployments rather than saying like, hey, let's go relax eighty two hundred because I think that's like a bigger path because I don't think this is generally safe. To recommend on the internet. Okay, so right. that's kind of my view on this. And, and the and the 08 came out like very recently, so most yeah, I haven't had a chance to look at it closely. And right, I, 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 and that was one of the like points of feedback I gave Darren. Right, I said like, okay, like you're trying to push this on everybody. Like instead, like talk about like what you have done rather than like say like, hey, this should apply on the internet. So that's kind of the um, direction I'm okay with. Yeah, ignore my, yeah, I mean, my comment is that before I, I read the draft, I didn't realize that there was this encapsulation going on followed by the insertion, right? Because that actually changes it. And as far as I can tell, it's the way it's constructed, it's not going to leak any of these headers because of the encapsulation. So the, the, the actual boundary of the domain is well defined. I mean, it might actually leak the whole encapsulated packet, but then you have other problems, right? But it's not going to leak the fact that it just inserted a packet. Suresh Krishnan. So like Eric, that was like one of the things that got removed in the SRH draft itself. So that was one of the points I brought up in the original SRH draft, which is now in the RFC HQ, and that got removed from the draft. It's 
specifically for this reason. So, yeah. Okay, so Eric, and then I think we will wrap up. Yeah, Eric, clarifying question, clarifying question for Suresh. So then, um, hypothetically, assuming things could get massaged into some acceptable state, is it hypothetically possible to publish both documents? Yeah, that's what I was, yeah. was going to say. I think we should continue working on both of these. Yeah. And like I that. think they can exist at the same time, and maybe we can get to the point of submitting them at the same time. But let's one step at a time. Absolutely. Like, personally, I think, like, um, it's both of them can exist, and both of them have a spot. Like, it, it's really, I don't think there's any uh, conceptual misalignment between these two things, like, uh, to be very frank. I don't disagree. I just wanted to. Get it down so verbatim. Yeah, let the minute taker know that these two documents can potentially exist together. Yes. So good. I think we are done. We're five minutes late, but all in all, not too bad. And well, no, it's we. It's this is. The, this was the. Actually, we had five minutes at the front for us to talk, so you were fine. Um, so, um, so I think this was a very constructive session. Um, we um, are not done with this topic. So I think this wraps up Six Man in Singapore. And I guess we'll see you all in Vancouver. Vancouver. Yes. A shorter trip for me, but good. Thank you. Do you have blue sheets? No, not yet. So if anyone knows where the blue sheets are, can you please bring them forward? Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, See, that's why I have the other two, so you can give me those and I'll bring them all.